Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Thank you. We're just waiting for a few more people to uh, come on onto the event uh, and then we'll make a start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for a few more people to come on and then we'll make a start. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining the latest in this series of In Conversation With. Um, some of you will know it's a succession of one-on-one -on -one discussions where we interview recognized and celebrated individuals of direct interest to uh, you, the CLA members. Um, so on behalf of the CLA, I'm delighted to welcome you to what I'm sure will be a really informative event. Uh, my name is Mike Valencia, I'm the Regional Director for the Southeast. So today's discussion uh, brings together our CLA president, Mark Bridgman, and Jake Vines, who's well known to many of you. I'm sure he won't mind me describing him as a force for nature, as well as a force of nature. Um, he has described himself as uh, what he does as multifunctional farming or environmental farming, and believes that farmers in the 21st century must cultivate as much as they can on their land. Fungi for the soil, grasses for the pollinators, weeds for the insects, insects for the birds, pasture for the livestock, for the long-term goals of carbon capture and food production. Um, importantly, he's been involved in uh, the National Landscape Service Panel um, and the Glover Review. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Jake, welcome. Um, I'd like to uh, just remind everyone that today's session is being recorded for future use, including availability to other members uh, on our website um, and your microphones and videos will be muted throughout the video and the format today is that Mark will have a discussion with Jake where he'll pose some questions um, of his own and then pose the questions that you ask so do please feel free to use the Q&A button um, and he'll attempt to cover as many of those as possible at the end. So thank you very much and I'll now like to hand you over to Mark and Jake.
Welcome, everybody, um, and uh, good afternoon, Jake. Um, thank you for everyone for joining, and Jake, uh, thank you for um, joining in. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I wonder if we could start off by sort of setting the scene a bit. Obviously, the agricultural bill is currently going through Parliament, and it will start a process um, next year of basic payments being removed, um, total move away from the old system we've been used to for under the common agricultural policy to ELMS, the pay public funds for public goods model that the government is currently developing. I just wondered what, how you feel, you know, the, the industry, how ready it is um, to, co to cope with this very major move. Um, and, you know, are you optimistic about this direction of travel? Um, perhaps we could start off with that and sort of explore the, the big picture. Um, the industry, uh, 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 a livestock farmer works two years in advance. A, uh, an arable farmer works for the here and now. And an accountant works a year behind. So the whole of the agricultural sector actually needs to know what it's working towards. The deep frustration with the lack of information coming out of government on We've been told that, what the, that the support mechanism is going to be reduced over a period of time, but we're not really sure on what it's being replaced with. So there's, a, there's an element of nervousness with what is being proposed because the proposal hasn't landed on our desk in a format that we can understand it. We've got lots of ideas and we've got a 25-year environment, uh, uh, environment plan, we've got agricultural bill going in front of the Lords, we've got environment bill, so all these things that and we, we went through the, the consultation process, which feels like a millennia ago, but we still don't have a clear um, roadmap of the direction. So, I'm, uh, so how does an industry cope with the unknown? We have a vague idea and we're gonna be paid for public goods and we're gonna see direct support removed over a period of seven years. Um, but uh, it's, it's how do we change our businesses and how do we prepare for that when we don't know? I think we, agri-environment has been around for nearly 30 years. So I think we can uh, use that as an indication of some sort of public good that we might get paid for. We're currently waiting to understand what the level of payment will be. Um, and there was a report that came out about a month ago that gave us an inkling but again, not enough information. So I do have concerns that we're gonna see uh, a reduction in support with nothing to replace it and not having the ability to create change within our businesses and make them resilient and robust to, to, see, this, to see this transition take place. Okay. Um, so as you say, it's still pretty high level, um, the direction of travel. Um, I've actually, an interesting call with DEFRA today about some of this and we might pick up that later and hopefully we're going to hear a bit more detail later this year. How, how do you think farmers and land managers can start to prepare? As you say we don't know the details but we know the direction of travel. Um, you know, how, what, what are the things that we as farmers should start to be thinking about um, you know, as, if given we know the broad direction of travel? Um, and how can we get people to embrace, for example, countryside stewardship? Um, the way I, as I look at it, I need to, main, I need to maintain my income. Um, uh, I, can, I can sell my wheat forward, I can go into different schemes, I can sell locally my produce, um, but I can't, my support mechanism, I have no control over. But I do know there is one support mechanism that we seem to uh, keep to one side. We have direct, we have pillar one, pillar two, we have direct support, and then we have agri-environment. And which crop is going to, is a guaranteed, going to meet your budget this year, is your agri-environment. If I look at the crops in Norfolk at the moment, we are not going to meet the budgeted yields as expected. If I look at the milk, the expected milk flow from the cattle, the calves aren't going to put the weight on because there's no grass. But I know I will get my agri-environment payment. And we know all the issues about past payments, but I think the RPA have improved significantly. And I think it's uh, uh, in the high 90% of, 
uh, those participating have now received their, their support. If not, they've got, got some sort of bridging payment. So how would I make my business more robust? I would, uh, I would enter into agri-environment as soon as possible because it's uh, next year I'm going to see my direct support reduced from 5 to 25%. And that's how I can maintain it. So that my advice is embrace it. If you haven't already, if you've been bitten before and you're slightly shy of it, it has improved. It's becoming easier to apply. Um, there's, there's a range of different organizations giving great advice. Um, speak to your neighbors that are doing it learn from them um, and I think that will make you more resilient at least for the next few few years. Thank you. Now I would certainly back that up. I mean I, on this call um, with DEFRA this morning they were talking about how and um, they're going to try and improve countryside stewardship in this sort of window that we're going to have between now and when Elms is available in late 24 and they are going to be trying to simplify it as well. Um, which I think is will be good news and we'll hopefully hear more about that later this year. So I would completely agree with you there. What about the whole idea of, you know, one of the things that Elms is going to support, we believe, is landscape scale delivery, whether that's on a river catchment or on a landscape scale or on a coastal plain or whatever it might be. So the idea that, that um, nature, the environment is, you know, if you can, if you can do it at, at scale, it's a huge, much greater benefit. How can we start to sort of think about that, do you think, as farmers? Um, fine if you're on a 25,000 acre estate, but for, for those that are running, you know, 100 acres, 200 acres, few hundred acres, thinking about collaboration. So, um, so Elms is expected to be a three tier system. One will be some sort of base payment um, and it will be, it might be a cross compliance type of payment and we don't know what level that'll be. The next payment will be sort of enhanced agri-environment. And then you have tier three, which I was, there was slight nervousness in some of the language that was coming up because they were referring to land use change as part of tier three. And I'm not sure what that meant. Is that reverting uh, freshwater grazing marshes to salt marsh? Is that rewilding? So I'm not, that's not clear. But I think whether, um, having spent 25 years managing land, uh, size becomes irrelevant. Um, so I've, work, I've worked with farmers that have holdings of, a, of 50 hectares, 150 acres. Um, and actually we can all do our bit. Uh, you can all, we all have land. We've, we've historically over the far past 40, 50 years of the CAP, we've been farming the entire farm. And some of those areas are not as productive as we might wish. And those are the areas that are both best suited for in environmental endeavors. So you, so every farmer knows his farm better than everyone else. Every farm, the amount of farmers that I've got the wettest field and I've got the driest piece of soil and I've got, you know, too many people or whatever, but actually we all have those issues. So you can identify that yourself. And then you look at the suite of options. And do you think, do you think that's, do you think that's just, experience of knowing knowing that field as you say over the years or do you think technology is going to make that easier with soil mapping or how how in your experience where you've done this have you have you identified the bits that you're going to um, focus on for environmental conservation work my my my, my experience to date or in the, in the past 20 years has been speaking to the guy who sits on the tractor speak to the guy who moves the cattle morning and night. They know that farm better than anyone. Um, but actually with the advent of technology and with you know, satellite and yield mapping, you know, we can actually be quite detailed and specific on what's working and what's not. And I refer to field realignment where you, make, you take out those areas use, utilizing the GPS technology, utilizing the satellite imagery and actually can quite clearly identify areas that are not productive. Yeah, okay. Um, I'd like to move on and explore some of the sort of practical realities of good conservation, and you've just touched on some of that um, just now, and your experience at, at uh, Ramlingham and, and now at Hocum. That there is this um, question about whether or not the direction of travel should be, um, you know, 
intensification of farming, you know, where the good land that's really just go for maximum output um, and do conservation and do rewilding in the areas that have got, you know, a, a, a not profitable farming. So like the two extremes. Um, or there's a middle ground, which, um, you know, I know, I think, you know, you, you have supported. Do you want to just explore that? Because there is, you know, there is, a, there, the, you get very different views on whether, whether we go down the, the rewilding on the one hand um, and, and intensification or the, or the sort of integrated approach. So I come at it, I come at it from different angles. I come at it from an economic angle. And that's the conversation I have with the farmer. Uh, I then come come with it from an ecological aspect, and that's where I uh, so that's where I put my nature hat on, and how can I combine the two? So uh, nature needs to move through landscapes. It can't have barriers. It can't have we can't have uh, a, you know we can't have areas of deep intensification uh, with uh, satellites of rewilding where there's high biodiversity because that biodiversity realistically needs to move through the landscape unhindered and unharmed. So we can use the areas of intensification that, uh, that are highly productive and efficient, and they all will all have areas that are not sufficiently productive for that business. And those are the connections, those are the veins that, that connect the vital organs of nature. So we can all play our part, um, and we can, I can connect through farming businesses, the rewilding project in Sussex with the rewilding project in Norfolk and circumnavigate London. And that's the, that is a, that's a real possibility while still producing food and feeding people. So do you think on an individual farms, um, it's about doing that, the, the sort of the messy corners, the unprofitable bits of the fields that, that, that you alluded to? Or do you think it's about a sort of um, a whole farm approach um, that, that's more important? Um, you know, I, I've been, from my reading for um, lockdown at the moment, or one of the things I've recently bought is, um, which I know you're a fan of, Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil, which uh, I haven't read yet, but uh, everyone keeps telling me I must, just about the whole push for sort of regenerative agriculture and better understanding our soil. And that obviously is a whole farm approach What's your view on that and your experience of that versus the messy corners, if you like? I, I, I get deep, I get frustrated with messy corners because when farms 60 years ago, when our, when our environment was alive and uh, vibrant, we, we didn't have messy corners. We had farms that were farmed and it was across the whole farm that produced this biodiversity. We mustn't marginalize nature to the corners we must have a whole farm approach. But the image in the background, I can sell to every farmer because every farmer would be proud of having that on his farm. I cannot sell thistles, ragwort and docks to any farmer to say, this is nature, this is how it's going to work. But when I remember hay meadows, and we've lost 97% of hay meadows in the last 40 years, when I remember those as a child, they were not full of these noxious weeds they were full of wispy fine grasses and crickets and flowers because they were managed. And they were managed without prescriptions, prescriptions that define dates. Uh, so all the current agri-environments, and there has to be an element of uh, understanding and control on what we're being paid for. But I think if the farmers were to um, engage with ecologists and ecologists engage with farmers, to have an understanding of what, both, what each is trying to achieve. And we can still have a landscape that is a, appealing to the eye and is, and is functional and is delivering food and uh, enhancing and providing biodiversity, which in turn, they work with each other. I guess that links to this sort of concept of paying for the outcome rather than paying, you know, currently in a stewardship scheme, as long as you, you as long as you can show you've sown something in a field, you get the money. There's no linkage between whether you've done a good job or not. Whereas the rest of the field, you know, you're sowing, you're growing your wheat, you put all your effort into maximizing the, uh, the yield of that wheat or those lambs. Um, whereas on the conservation stuff, there is no incentive right now 
to, to do it well. You just have to make sure you measured it correctly because that's the thing that they'll come down at you on. So British farmers are some of the best in the world and they can produce high quality, high yielding crops um, efficiently on, on most of the area. But um, they need, it's applying that same approach to nature. But nature isn't as cut and dry as producing 8, 10, 12 tonnes a hectare of wheat. We have so many variables. You know, we're currently, we've just gone from one weather event to another. We've had flood through to famine. So we've got the dry, yeah. dry period. So, we, so it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, pay for a, uh, delivering so many lapwing chicks or so many bumblebees or butterflies because it's quite fluid and then we have to throw climate change into the equation. So we need to know if we've got multifunctional ecosystems, they are more resilient. And if we say apply that same, the same process to producing food as producing biodiversity, you will, you're, you're more resilient to um, climate change and you can deliver those goods, but very difficult to measure them. Just, I'm, I'm, I've read that Hokum, um, that the, the estate is, or the, 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 the in-hand farming operation, are your, been, has been over the last couple of years moving to try and reduce what's been termed the sides, the insecticides, uh, the pesticides, not necessarily get rid of them altogether, but, but trying to reduce the amount of chemicals that are going on. Could you just talk about how, what the experience has been um, as, as you've understood it before you, uh, you, you've arrived and since you've arrived and, and what that journey is like and, 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 and where you're trying, where as a team you're trying to get that to. So, so the, 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 uh, the catalyst of change probably happened about eight years ago when Paul Hoverson was appointed as director of farming. And uh, he could, he, I think, uh, and this is anecdotal, but when he arrived, there was land, productive land not being farmed efficiently, but there was also <clears throat> less care and attention to the soil. Um, and if we then go back to Cook of Norfolk, who developed the four crop rotation and integrated livestock, um, Paul really brought that back to Holcomb, um, understanding the importance of the sheep. Although in Cook of Norfolk's time, it was more about the growing of the sheep rather than the maintenance and care of the soil. Whereas Paul is applying that same approach for the health and uh, increasing the vitality of the soils at Holcomb to thereby increase the productivity of its, uh, of its arable and root crops. Um, so he, he started to, put in catch crops, cover crops, that then came as part of the agro-environment. Uh, and all we've, we've seen now in the time I've been here, where we're seeing more, being more ambitious in challenging themselves on what they can do and how they can do it. Um, the farm manager, James Beamish, uh, is looking at these multi-mixed uh, species crops that are trying to do so many things, but already in conversations in the field. Are we, get, are we being overly prescriptive to ourselves and thereby missing the point on what we're trying to achieve. So it's a, it's a wonderful learning curve and we've kind of got a demonstration farm uh, called Great Farm, which is a hundred hectares, the size of an average English farm. And that, that farm, we're testing ourselves, trying to enhance biodiversity, trying to improve the soil, um, trying to be very transparent in what we're doing and, there, and then feeding that out as Cook of Norfolk did to, every, to everyone else to say, this is, this is a sure winner to improving your farm's productivity and economics. Um, and this actually didn't really work for us, but we learned from it. And, and is it on the, on the, the inputs, the, ins, the, you know, the insecticides, the pesticides, is it about a sort of trying to gradually reduce it? Is it about targeting it better? Or is it about doing only doing it on some fields and not others. Is it, what, what is the sort of ethos? So, uh, so Lord Leicester threw the gauntlet down of no sides by 2030. Um, that was a very large gauntlet. Right. Um, so, uh, so I think the challenge is, is, to, is to reduce inputs, steadily reduce inputs, see where year on year where you can make changes. Um, uh, already the, the uh, compound fertilizers are virtually non-existent through using uh, uh, AD, AD um, uh, 
uh, one of the, the yeah the, yeah the AD the AD, uh, the AD waste yeah, yeah. The, the AD waste so that that's been that's been a win. We then look at the utilising of these uh, cover crops that the sheep are grazing. There's less use for insecticides in the soil for growing potatoes. Uh, we then look at by planting uh, more areas for predatory species. Can we reduce the requirement for summer insecticides? I'm slightly more relaxed with, I know the importance of, uh, with the removal of uh, neonics, the importance of autumn herbicides to reduce aphid viruses. Uh, so, but if, can, can we have enough pollinators, enough uh, spiders and hoverflies that will, and ladybirds that will remove the aphids from our cereal during the summer? So these are sort of, these are areas we need to explore. Fascinating. Um, you, you mentioned neonics, I mean, obviously rape as a, as a product, as a crop across the, the, the country has been under huge pressure as a result of that and other things. Um, are there other sort of new crops that you're in, that, that are being introduced into the, I mean, you, you mentioned cover crops as a, as a generalization, but on the sort of, if you like, the, the, the farmed crops that are, that are being introduced to try and um, um, help in this process? I, I think the importance of rotation. Uh, so we, uh, I think every farmer is scratching his head for a new crop. Uh, soya, I know there are individuals in Cambridgeshire trying soya. Pigeons love soya more than rape. So, <laughs> but then the, there's a direct correlation with the planted area of uh, rape as there is with the pigeon population. So with no rape or virtually no rape being grown next year, maybe our pigeon population will disappear. Um, so uh, conversations that James and I are having is that with these multifunctional crops, so crops that deliver biodiversity, crops that enhance the soil, crops that feed livestock, um, crops that prepare us for the following crop. And we always, historically, we had things called fallow. Before we had set aside, and we actually fallowed the land to let it rest, to prepare it for the following crop. So it's applying these new 21st applications to historic good quality land management. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, so much of it is about what our grandparents were yeah. doing and it's been... It's um, interesting, maybe... just, interesting, just, well, Gabe Brown, if you yeah. read the farming ladder that was written a hundred years prior to Gabe Brown, it's exactly the same principles. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Just moving, moving slightly to the, to, well, within the farm landscape, but just, I'd like to just explore the whole, your thoughts on hedge, hedges, trees, um, and, and, and that part of the farm landscape. I know you feel passionately about hedges. Um, what, what, what are the, some of the sort of lessons that you've learned, um, and obviously it's different in different parts of the country, about, about trees in the farm landscape? We've got this massive push from the government for we all need to be planting more trees. Um, what, what are your, your, your advice when you're talking to people about, about this subject? So, so interesting, I, I gave an interview to, um, to I, well, I spoke with an individual who's going to write a piece for the spectator about literally about trees and this huge push for during the election every each individual party was going to plant more trees than the other party uh, so we look at all the issues within our woodlands we look at uh, leaf miner ash dieback um, acute oak decline so we're seeing our what woodlands we have are under real pressure so actually, can we restock those woodlands first? Can we allow for natural regeneration? We also have a high deer population. So how can we, how can we let that naturally take place? Um, we, we're going, we are going to lose, we are going to lose some of those um, ancient grandfather ash trees that we see in our landscape, specifically in the, in the uplands. Um, already, I know Derbyshire is really starting to feel the pressure of ash dieback. So what, what, what can we look at solutions to replant those areas? Uh, with regard hedgerows, um, I th I, hedgerows are your most expensive operation on the farm. Uh, they're your, whether you're laying them, whether you're, whether you're flailing them, uh, and do we really, if I'm gonna see my direct support reduced, where am I gonna make my greatest saving? My greatest saving is going to reduce my hedge cutting first and foremost. And if I buffered that with, our, with a newly created hay meadow, I actually, my annual cutting prevents it spreading 
Um, I think Charlie, Charlie Barrow, a dear friend of mine, says that the hedges that, that are nine meters wide are sufficiently wide enough to house nightingales. If I make my hedges nine meters wide, I, in some fields I lose most of the field. So I, I, can't, I, can't do, I, can't, I can't go to that extent, but I can allow them to gain height. And I, instead of following my agro-environment prescriptions, which is advice saying cut no more than once in three years, I might coppice once in 10 years and use that for biomass. And then I've got a rotation, you know, which is what historically was done. So I think we just, we just look at the economics, pull back. If the hedge is going north-south, it has very little impact on the growing crop either side of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just, um, you know, in the, the estates where, where you've worked, um, they've both had large, um, in, um, large in-hand farming operations that, um, that you would have been um, involved with, but also big, um, large numbers of tenants. And obviously that's certainly the case at, at, at Hokum. Um, how have you worked? What has you been your experience and what is your advice of how you've worked successfully or, or not um, with, with tenant farmers to take them on the journey of what you've been trying to do, um, maybe on the, on the home farm side, um, so that one can get that sort of collaboration um, for, on conservation? So the first thing is to do when you, when, you, when you invite them into their kitchen is promise that you're not going to raise their rent. Um, and once they, you've secured their confidence that that is the case, and then actually you're going to hopefully provide them with some sort of income, which is going to make their farm more efficient, um, which is the, as the same as their neighbor, then uh, the conversation, uh, so if, if uh, with multiple tenant farmers, I have, uh, I have uh, given them an agri-environment income that was the equivalent to their rent. Then when you explain that everything in the middle of the field is all yours. So that makes them feel quite proud and they to, to carry on doing what they're doing and don't feel like the, the pressure to service the rent. So the agro environment is your, is your, is your rent master. Um, and then it's, uh, and the more of the, the better you, uh, and the more buy-in you have with your agro environment, the better it'll be. And if you start working with your neighbors, uh, government, you know, we look at facilitation funds and cluster farms, um, that actually opens additional doors to you. So, you know, these, these businesses that are really nervous with removal of direct support, this is a lifeline to these businesses. And from a landowner's perspective, you know, we, a landowner spreads his risk. I, I can't remember, who the great landowner's quote was, but owning land was about tax avoidance and claiming grants. And I think that still is the case. Um, I guess, I, mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right on the point about landscape and collaboration, because I think, certainly I hope that through Elms, we'll, there will be rewards for, for people to do this, to collaborate. So farmers, all, all farmers were all good at, you know, you know if, if, there's an in, if there's an incentive there to work together, I think that will really help drive behavioral change. Um, final question for me, because I know, um, you know, we've had quite a few questions coming in, um, was really to talk about one of the real challenges in conservation, and that's the, the, the tension between um, people, um, uh, in brackets, with their dogs that they can't control, um, and conservation. And I think I read somewhere that Hokum has you know, around a million people visiting um, the nature reserve or the whole estate, I'm not sure what it is. So you're obviously very live to the challenges. Um, and as we think about the future schemes, public funds and public goods, um, part of it is it's, if it's a public good that we're delivering, you know, that, that we're wanting to get more people out and to better understand the countryside. What, what have been some of your lessons that you've learned um, and, and advice that you would give about how we manage this tension, if it's possible? Um, so, yeah, so in the last, uh, last few days has been um, uh, particularly challenging from a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a coastal strip. Yeah. Um, so how do we, uh, historically, we've, it's always been sort of get off my, keep off my land. We need to kind of embrace this. And, and Natural England went through a process where they put permissive access 
into agri-environment, they pulled back from it because they, it was too challenging for them at that time. I think we, we are the ones that need to grasp this. We are the ones that need to create access that works for us. And access doesn't have to be uh, 365 days a year permissive access. Access can be bringing urban, uh, urban dwellers into a rural landscape and then we get to engage with them and, and uh, explain what we're trying to do. But also the, trying to maintain that fragility within uh, natural landscapes where there are times of years where birds are trying to breed um, and we, we need to leave, leave nature in peace to do what it does. Uh, we've tried at Holcomb, what we've done here with vast numbers of people visiting is try to bring nature to them. So as they pull up, to, to go onto the beach. They're immersed in nature. There are birds calling, there are butterflies whizzing past. And, and even if they don't actually see it, and they've gone to the beach and they've done their bucket and spade thing and they've come back, I am of the belief that a part of them will have taken that on board. Uh, it's just because it's there, you just, if you open up a landscape uh, and as you get out of your car with your screaming children and uh, sweaty dog the you know if there are if there are just if there's 10,000 pink feet geese go over the top of your head you will notice that so it's it's that's the sort of way you can engage with people and feel that they're, they're part of it but actually there's a small invisible fence line that they can't see yeah Jake I'm gonna pull I'm gonna move it on to questions from other people now um, but I think I've just been scrolling through the questions and there's a question directly linked to what we've just been talking about so we might just continue that um, while we're on that theme um, and it's from uh, William Watson Armstrong I'd be interested to hear Jake's thoughts on how UK farmers can better engage and connect with the general public the customers and I suppose you, you talked about um, you know the car park that type of thing but what else what other tools particularly with modern technology do you think we should or could start to be thinking about deploying over the next sort of five to ten years so um, in these interesting times and we look at what what the CLA are doing with using this medium to talk to, to individuals uh, and we want to talk to as many people as as we can but there are elements that there are sections of society we'll never we will never engage with um, you know, Holcomb has vast numbers of uh, uh, social media followers, but it's a drop in the ocean to the millions that visit. So we're not going to engage with all of them. So how can we engage uh, in a way that they understand that the, the landscape is being cared and looked after for? We actually change the way it looks. You know, so as they're driving in their, in their car for, someone drove from Coventry, while still in lockdown to come to a beach with a car park that was closed last week. It was bizarre, but anyway. Um, but if they, if, as they drive through the landscape and they see it change and they see it full of uh, blossoming hedgerows and flowering margins, they will know that landscape, you've engaged, you've got their support. As soon as you mention, if you mention cutting roadside verges or hedgerows on social media, it goes mad because those are the things that really engage the public. So that's probably our easiest tool. Our landscape, the landscape that we manage, is the tool to engage with the public. There was a wonderful example of a farmer I spoke to um, a couple of years ago who was distraught that on his wild bird cover, the farmer, uh, the public were cutting down his sunflowers. But actually, who cares? That was engaging with the public. Let them cut the sunflowers down and take them away with them. And they know that the areas, the landscape's being looked after. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, a sort of general one here um, from uh, Rachel Walker. What's the best single thing that every farmer could do to improve conservation, which doesn't need major change or lots of money? Um, well, we refer, stop cutting your hedges. It's quite an easy one. Right. That's good. Yep. Okay. Um, I think really. Uh, um, there are subtle changes in the way you can move livestock. There's the way you are uh, looking at your inputs and your application times. 
real subtle changes. I'm not asking you to stop spraying your insecticide or herbicides. I'm not saying don't turn your cattle out. But actually, if we, if we move cattle at, in different areas at different stocking rates at different times, should have no impact on them, but actually should improve the environment. Okay. Um, Sorry, will improve the environment. Yep, okay. Um, a, a, a question sort of around skills um, from David Fisher. What training, training or requirements slash skills are needed um, for, you know, when we look forward to the, this is the exact words, but for the 25 year environment plan that it raises. So I guess we're thinking about, you know, what coming down the road with Elms, this whole 25 year environment plan about leaving the, um, the environment in a better place than we, we took it on. What, what are the skills that you think and how are we as farmers going to um, develop those skills or do we have to buy them in? Or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the, skill, the individuals that have the skills and the knowledge we require are no longer with us. So it's deeply unfortunate. Um, and I, I am every farmer, every farming group, every uh, large landowner should employ an ecologist. But every ecologist should employ a farmer. Because actually, when the two meet and they have an understanding of what everyone's trying to achieve, and you sit them in a dark room for a weekend, they will actually come up with solutions that work. Those subtle changes in practices, you know, the, the application of a, of a decision that can have a hugely detrimental effect. But if that, if that decision process was taken uh, at a later date or prior, can be actually really beneficial. And the ecologist will know what's right, and the farmer will know what works for him. Interestingly, I was with a, a, a farmer who is an ecologist today, looking at chalk grassland. And we had slightly tweaked the grazing of the animals. And we've done it in several places at, at Holcomb this year, where we've put the cattle on early and pulled them away. And then we've moved them to the lusher grass on the lower meadows. And we're starting to see these areas, which have had no uh, fertilizer and no herbicide, started to bloom with flowers. And then the cattle will come back because it's still far part of a farming system. So you've had this wonderful burst of uh, color and brightness and pollinators, but then the farm, then you take the trash off by using a grazing system. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that point about ecologists and farmers working together. I think that's gonna be a crucial part of the future elm skin if it's gonna work effectively. Um, next question is from uh, John Kressel. Uh, no sides by 2030 is interesting. What's your approach to the mold board plow and its negative effect on soil structure? Do you think you can eliminate the herbicides and the plow? Uh, currently, with what I know at the moment, not just yet. We're not ready for this huge leap of faith. Uh, we've got some wonderful individuals doing some really groundbreaking stuff on low tillage, zero tillage, non-tillage. Uh, and part of that process, the herbicide is quite crucial to that. So we have these, uh, we, we put in these multiple species crops, we put in temporary grass lays, legume lays. Uh, at some point there is a desiccant and at some point there is a need for to remove excess competition. So I don't think we're quite ready for that. You know, in a winter that we've just had, everyone that had hid the plough in the corner of the shed got the plough out again. Yeah. Um, strangely, those, those that did, there was a wonderful picture on Twitter today of a farmer that had ploughed half the field in November and half in February, and half of, his, half of the field had potato crop in it and half of it didn't. So, um, the instance of bringing the plough wasn't necessarily white, right in a summer where we've got we've gone to an extreme of no no moisture at all. So we yeah. can we can learn, learn we can learn by years like this on what's right right and what's wrong. Okay, um, some sort of specific ones. Um, question from Thomas Weekly Hubbard. Um, many individuals are interested in uh, assessing their natural capital. 
in trying to learn what the base level of that natural capital is on their farm or land? What guidance would Jake give to those individuals who wish to undertake this exercise, but are not sure where to start? Um, data, data information, baseline surveys are really key. Slightly frustrated that some organizations take us back to 1970 to give us our baseline. Um, let, let's 2020, 2021 be the year of baselines in our farm landscape. Uh, keep it quite simple. Um, uh, I'm having some ponds surveyed this year before we carry out work. And the ecologist comes, you know, my Latin is pretty poor at the best of times, but comes with these huge lists of different species and uh, dragonflies, damselflies, you know, things that I've never heard of. And I said, no, let's keep it simple, because once you've done the baseline survey, once I know how many yellow hammers and how many great crested newts I haven't got, um, I can then act on that, and then I can take ownership of it. So get someone, get an organization, you know, the FIAG organization is quite good. Um, there, there are plenty of other land agents who, who are seizing this opportunity and employing possibly your ecologist, but make sure it's simple. Don't make it overly complicated because it will tie you in knots and you won't know the direction of travel for your own farming business. You'll try to please, you can't please every, all of ecology all of the time. Good advice. Okay. Um, question here from Richard Elmhurst. 25,000 acres gives you um, some scope for rewilding or conservation. Um, how could a farmer on 120 acres of grass do his bit? He could, uh, on 120 acres of grass, say we go back to the hedge. Uh, a lot of people went, went uh, so I assume he's running uh, livestock on his grass. Some of it will be for forage and some of it will be for running livestock. Um, it's taking your fence lines away from your hedge to allow the hedge to come out, but allows you still because the opportunity to drop your flail mower in periodically uh, and uh, try and increase the diversity of the species within the sward and then don't leave areas ungrazed for times in the year, but allow them to be grazed by the end of the year. Simple, simple, really simple, straightforward stuff. Um, question from Judy Fortescue. I'm keen to plant trees on some of my permanent pastures, creating a parkland effect. What do you think the chances are of persuading Natural England to pay me to achieve this? Currently, only land currently described as historic parkland is eligible for this type of support. So I guess there's two questions. One is the sort of technical one around you know, payments, um, but also your views on those sort of individual trees on a, in a landscape rather than you know, just having you know, woods and you know, wood here, field here. Uh, the, uh, the view behind me is, is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is a wood pasture, uh, uh, you know, designed 200 years ago by uh, Repton. Uh, so we can, we, you know, the, the English countryside is littered with parklands, old and new. We can recreate wood pasture. So, and I, I am of the belief that wood pasture is an option under higher tier. So there's no reason if she has the ambition to create wood pasture on her grassland, then there is a mechanism to achieve that. So, and it will be funded. Okay. Um, Sorry, I just uh, missed my point question here. Um, are you undertaking, um, we're getting onto the thorny issue of predators, are you undertaking active predator control across the estate and educating visitors as to why predator control is needed as part of active conservation management? I ask this question in view of the current lockdown and the marked increase in shooting estates in legal snares and traps being vandalized, call birds being released from nuts and traps, all in locations well away from public footpaths. And this is from Charlotte Marison. So, um, so, so firstly, we do exercise species management at Holcomb. Uh, we are relatively public in it, but we don't sort of we don't jump up about up and down about it uh really important on the nature reserve uh slight frustration with general licenses on triple size and designated mm -hmm. sites 
which I did receive my COVID license uh, yesterday, which was a bit after the horses bolted. Um, so species management, I think, is a part of land management currently until we have the multifunctioning ecosystems to allow some sort of hierarchy, a balanced hierarchy of a prey and predator. Um, we have to carry, carry it out. And we're with the BTO this week came out with a report saying fox populations have decreased by 15% in the last um, 20 years. Well, I think I, I firmly put that down to technology and thermal imaging and night vision. So we're, become, we're coming better at becoming better at it. Okay. Um, what a uh, question from Rodney Morgan. What options do you foresee for low fertility arable chalk land? Um, chalk grassland. Chalk grassland every time. Uh, so sell, the, sell the combine. Sell, sell the combine. Um, and, and, and actually your gross margins will increase. Okay. Um, question here. Sorry, I'm going to keep a step ahead here. Uh, from Ben, ben uh, apologies for pronunciation, Makarov, Makarovkovsky. How uh, have you completed a carbon calculator for Hokum? Um, what are the results and what are you and, and how are you reducing your inputs? And I I guess I'd be interested, you know, part of the follow on to that is, you know, you know, exactly what are you doing having done the work if you've done it yet? So firstly, hi, Ben. And I've known Ben for a few years and I can't pronounce his surname either. <laughs> um, so uh, the frustration, the frustration is, is that there are 64 carbon calculator tools giving you 64 different results on 64 different days. So we need uh, trying to understand which one suits your business better than another, because I don't think where, where are the, where are my carbon boundaries? Do I, you know, at what point am I saying, well, actually the fertilizer, I'm only the diesel I'm using to apply the fertilizer is my carbon usage, or is it the manufacturing of the fertilizer, but doesn't that lie with the manufacturer? So these are all, you know, I, uh, I'm very privileged to run, uh, the largest land-based nature reserve in England. Um, and I probably have the greatest carbon sink that probably offsets all of Hol Holcomb's um, carbon emissions, uh, include, including the bovine that graze it beautifully. Okay. So, it's, so I don't think the science is there yet, but we're, we're, we are scratching our heads, looking at different options and might just take a baseline on probably the most favoured favored, uh, carbon tool at the moment um, and see where we come out. Okay. Um, just a plug for the CLA there. We do have on our website, there's a very good um, um, advice piece that shows um, people um, different tools to use. Um, so it'd be worth looking at that. And also um, a very good policy piece just about carbon generally and the move to low carbon um, and all the different challenges because it's a very nuanced, complex debate, um, you know, whether you're, when you're looking at livestock um, and all, all aspects of that. So please do um, look at that on our website. And in late November, our big annual conference, hopefully uh, the QE2 Centre will be about that road to net zero across farms and estates. Um, and if it's not uh, at the QE2 Centre, it'll be virtual in some form. Um, linking to that, Point. Um, nice controversial one here from Godfrey Menel. Do you agree that growing arable crops to feed animals for meat and dairy is an extravagance we can no longer afford? Um, yes, I, I personally believe that. I think we need to eat uh, less meat, but better quality meat. Um, you know, we're, we're aiming to be the, the, the cattle to be uh, pasture fed in, 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 the, in the future um, because a, bo uh, you know, a bovine needs to eat grass, not, not cereal. Uh, so I am, a, I am the belief that actually we should eat yeah, less meat and then we can actually look at other crops that we can use that and utilize that land for. Okay. Um... Right. Um, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up another one here. Um, regenerative agriculture and the focus of profit per acre. This is from Jack uh, Williams Ellis. Instead of maximizing yield is a viable solution to UK farms. So I guess we touched on this through our discussion, but it's, it's this sort of idea that it's not about how much you produce, um, but uh, the profit on that land. Um, how does that, do you think, sit alongside the need um, you know, to produce fee food for, for the nation, basically? Well, we're currently, I think, in your conversation last week, we're 60% sufficient in our food production. Yeah. Um, we, uh, but if we're going to eat less meat, there's a less reliance on the area we're currently growing food for meat production. So that frees up land to produce other food. Um, I think that uh, the, regenerative, the regenerative approach and part of it, and we must, when we read dirt to soil or we read the farming ladder, we must remember that those, it was either 100 years ago with a lower population or it was, or it's in North Dakota. So you can't apply some of the principles, but you can apply some of the key objectives in regenerative agriculture to any farm business. And that, and that, there, and that then allows us to look at the economics of our, of our current farming system, which um, is deeply uneconomic. I am of the belief that most, uh, a, a proportion of arable growers don't know the cost of production for a ton of wheat. And once we understand that, we realize that actually some parts of our business aren't as economically robust as we once thought. So we need to look at alternatives. And the first alternative, and a lot of farmers are now questioning their agronomists because they feel that their agronomist is actually, from the big agribusiness, just trying to increase their profits to the detriment of, of himself. So the first thing, you know, how many farmers this year applied their T noughts, ones and twos on their cereals? And actually, your prescription from your agronomist would have said, no, no, you need to apply them every three weeks or every tiller or whatever it is. Um, but actually, in hindsight, you shouldn't have applied any of them because the risk of any sort of fungal diseases in this year, this summer, were fairly low. Yeah, and, and looking at forecast, still pretty low. There's absolutely no rain coming. So I've been put a message that, um, you know, we've nearly run our hour and I should ask one more question. So although I'd like to stay asking questions for a lot longer, I'm going to ask one more question. And that is from uh, Charlie Hambry. If it was in your power, what single and immediate policy or change would you implement today? Um, what would I, if it's in my power, I would, um, oh God, that's a big question. That's a big <laughs> question. I, I would probably uh, re remove insecticide applications in the summer from, from, from uh, April onwards, no insecticide applications. I think that would have a huge, huge effect from biodiversity. Very interesting, Very interesting indeed. Um, okay. Um, Jake, thank you very much indeed. That's been really fascinating. I um, really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you um, for doing it. Um, and um, I'm sure those that have been listening or will listen in the future because it will be on our website. So anyone listening who found, who thinks their neighbor, friend, um, children or partner should, should listen, um, please um, direct them to the website. Um, our, the in conversation I did with Henry Dimbleby, um, um, Two weeks ago, we've had all about you know, 900 people have, have, have watched it since, so um, they'll be remain up there. Um, I'm going to do a quick plug for a couple of others that have got coming up. We've actually just heard today that um, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, the new Minister of Agriculture, Victoria Prentice, is going to do um, an in-conversation discussion with me, and that will be on the 18th of June. Um, obviously, by then, we'll have a clearer idea on the agricultural bill. There'll be lots to talk around about um, regarding um, um, the um, elms and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure you all have questions. So please put that in your diary. And before that, um, we've got, um, um, you can see on the screen now, I hope you can see on the screen, I certainly can. Next week, um, you'll recall, for those that, that have been taking part in a few of these, 
we have a number of sort of more technical type webinars, um, um, you know, probably one a week, as well as these more broad brush sort of interviews. So on the sort of more technical side, next Thursday, we've got one on forestry, and there'll be a number of speakers on that, uh, sort of more of a workshop type approach, and that's 11 o'clock next Thursday. The following week, um, Wednesday the 10th, um, a session on planning and development. Um, and then on the 12th of June, um, an in conversation with uh, Professor Alistair Driver, Director of um, Rewilding Britain. And as I say, um, I will be back in the interview seat on the 18th um, to interview Victoria Prentice. So um, with that, um, thank you much, everyone, for participating. Jake, thank you very much indeed. And um, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.